I'm Audrey Holman. Welcome to another episode of CDCI Connect. I am here with Hannah Galvin and Katie Carroll. And today we're going to talk about uh, their experiences with disability and mentoring and service animal outreach and a bunch of, of other things. Uh, could I ask each of you to introduce yourselves, uh, tell us your full name, um, where you're from, and a little bit about your experience with disability. Hannah, I'm going to ask you to go first. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Hannah Gallivan. I'm from Bristol, Vermont. Um, and I have cerebral palsy. Um, and I live with it. And it's a big part of who I am. So yeah, that's my experience with it. And I'm Catherine Carroll. I go by Katie. I live in Albany, New York. Um, I'm a disabled woman. I happen to be a lawyer. I work in disability and aging services generally. And I was, um, I got to meet Hannah through uh, the Disability Empower Network. Can you tell me a little bit more about how the two of you met? Like, how did how did that that meeting come about? Did you both sign up for the network? Were you kind of randomly assigned? Did you seek each other out or find each other in some way? Um, so I applied for, we met through Empower Camp, um, which is one of the programs that um, the Empower Network does, um, among other things. And I applied um, for, what was the or what is the first um year of camp which is really exciting um me and the group of other people are the inaugural group so that's very exciting um and a friend sent me the application and was like hey i think this would be really cool for you to do um and so during our first part of the program which um when we spent um a week together in the Adirondacks, we talked about what our projects would be like, and then um, we got paired up with mentors. Um, and on my end, I got to write down a couple of people who I would have wanted to mentor me and also um, like what I was looking for in a mentor. Um, and so Katie and I were paired up um, and we've been working together on my project for the last year-ish or so. Um, and yeah, that's how I met Katie on my side. But if you have anything to add, Katie, go ahead. Sure, so um, I joined, I'm, in, I'm very involved with the Disability Empower Network and I volunteered to be, to work at the camp, but also serve in this mentor role. So it was, went well beyond the, you know, just the week of camp that we had. And it's been a pleasure to work with Hannah and um, have that like mentor mentee relationship that I think, I mean, it's the, the purpose of Disability Empower Network. Um, we recognize the need of uh, youth, um, particularly girls and non-binary folks with disabilities um, for mentorship. And I, I honestly feel like I'm being mentored, so. Hannah, you mentioned that you have been working together with Katie on uh, your project. Can you tell us a little bit about what that project is? Yeah, um, so as part of the program, um, all of the girls in the program are um, supposed to um, have a like, no, it's not a super formal project, but um, just like something they wanna work on regarding um, like disability and um, disaster preparedness and emergency situations. Um, so during that weekend in Adirondacks, we sort of started brainstorming and Stephanie, our executive director was like, when you think about this project, um, think about something that you're really interested in and want to take that sort of lens and how can it relate to um, like 
disaster preparedness. So um, I am really passionate about service animals and actually in the process um, I'm waiting to get one myself and um, I was struck by the fact that you are able to bring your service dog anywhere um, but what happens if you're in an emergency situation and you need to bring um, your dog to a shelter um, so that's basically where my project um, stemmed from and like in a nutshell it's and Katie if I'm missing anything in my explanation here you're free feel free to chime in but um in a nutshell it is um a project focused on making sure that people who work at those emergency shelters are educated around service animals and what they do um and making sure that people with disabilities who have those service animals um, are able to be accommodated and um, welcomed into those shelters with their animals. So yeah, and um, you and I, we did a lot of research, we kind of um, learned about the landscape of what tools and guides and things and information is available to people in Vermont, especially on the internet you know, where a lot of people go for information. And you kind of, um, you ended up focusing on what the individual can do, what, you know, we can do to prepare ourselves. And you, uh, you ultimately focused on this guide that uh, CDCI was uh, initially a part of. And uh, we went from there. We wanted to improve it, make it um, acknowledge the role that a service animal may play in someone's life. And what people should think about when you know you might have to evacuate your home and go somewhere else. So, Hannah, what's the most um, interesting thing you discovered in your research around service animals and emergency preparedness? Um, that's a really good question, and my answer would kind of be. <laughs> The opposite of that, which is the most interesting thing I discovered was that there's not a lot of information out there um, to begin with. Like a lot of, um, I went into this project just being like, oh, I'll do a couple of, at least this was my mindset. I'm not sure about you, Katie. I was like, oh, I'll do a couple of Google searches. I'll find what I need to find. Like, it'll be great. Um, and it ended up we both sort of went down really big Google rabbit holes, um, trying to find any information that we could about um, emergency situations and surface animals. There was a lot about um, emergency situations and different links to stuff, but not much pertaining to people with disabilities or and even less pertaining to people with disabilities and service dogs. So, for me, I was that was really interesting um, because then I really realized like how needed this information is, and I'm really happy that I got to be um, a part of getting it out there to people. And um, I guess for me, just like realizing how much it was needed um, really made me like especially passionate about this project. May I answer that question too? Okay. Um, so it was interesting for me. So I'm in New York, like I mentioned, and we're talking about you know improving things in Vermont uh, for Vermonters with disabilities. Uh, so it was interesting for me to see what the the, lay, the I guess the lay of the land is in terms of emergency preparedness, like the government entities and who's involved and what's called what and whether you know regional things versus statewide things. And um, I guess to Hannah's point, like there's information out there, but it can be really confusing and discouraging the disabled folks, you know, like when information focuses on companion animals and pets or, you know, makes vague or not vague, but kind of indefinite statements like, you know, you may be able to bring your service animal with you to a shelter. Well, what does that mean? I may, <laughs> like I'm legally allowed, you know, this is, 
you know, I'm, you know, I'm legally allowed to bring my service animal with me. Like, what are the barriers to that? So um, it, I guess it's more interesting and also not surprising. It was, it was good to do a lot of research. This question is for both of you, um, but do you feel like um, having this connection through the mentorship uh, changed the way that you approached research for the project or changed what you were able to accomplish in researching uh, the role of service animals and disaster preparedness? Um, again, really good question. I think um, for me, I know that it was really helpful knowing that I would have a mentor um, because like going into it because um, I was initially like really overwhelmed about like, oh, this is this project and it can be so broad and um, about whatever topic I want. And like, I was initially like, how am I going to do this? Like, I, I don't really know where to start. So I think for me, like from the beginning and knowing that I would have a mentor um, to sort of guide me through this and give another perspective. And um, I've had meetings with Katie throughout this process and um, she's brought up stuff that I wouldn't have thought about um, and vice versa. So I think um, it's really valuable to like have another perspective, um, especially when you're doing this work. Um, I also tend to just like get really overwhelmed in general when I have something going on. And Katie was really good about being like, you're doing great. Like you're doing, you're doing great. So um, that was really nice. And I think um, it was, it was like throughout the process of like not finding stuff um, and just about this really kind of specific topic um, is really nice to also have my mentor be um, a disabled woman because we had that unique experience of like sharing that in common and um, that was really nice, so. So I guess I have two thoughts about in, in my answer to that question. Um, so yeah, Han Hannah's kind of started us on, on one of them, which is um, knowing to how to like bite off what we can chew in terms of like advocacy and what we can change and um, recognizing that a little can go a long way. So yeah, we didn't, you know, we didn't go full on like training people in shelters or anything like that, but we identified a place where, you know, we could get people to think about an additional need. Um, you know, as part of their whole emergency, you know, their individual emergency preparedness plan. So yeah, that, I guess that's something that I guess changed um, or that we realized along the way. And then another is that we, I guess we have to keep in mind like what, you know, we've, we've both spent a lot of time thinking about this, but not everyone has the capacity to do that, you know, like, we, you know, if we're living it, talking about it, like we're a little bit more resourced. Um, so we might know where to look for things. And I guess this isn't so much a change as just like a reminder of going through the process of, you know, what what is just, you know, that, app, you know, that person that's just looking for assistance or information, like what are they gonna find? How confusing is it gonna be? Uh, and how do we just, how do we reach that person? Not the people who get to think about disability and awareness all the time. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. This is a question for Hannah. Um, Hannah, what is one thing that you hope that readers of the Green Mountain Emergency Preparedness Guide take away from your research on service animals during disasters? Is there one particular thing that you hope everyone who sees your research takes away from it? Um, 
I guess, like, I don't know um, whether the audience of the guide will be, I assume it won't just be disabled people, but other people in general, if they're curious, um, just how instrumental um, surface animals are to people and um, how much misconception and sometimes misinformation is out there about, like, there's so many different types of service dogs and they all do completely different things. And I think um, in our society, there's a lot of like, not very clear information on what they do and how they're important. Um, so I would just hope that people um, really recognize how instrumental they are and um, like feel a little more educated walking away from um, reading the guide um my process was I didn't edit the whole thing because it's pretty long but I did add um like a service dog page to the already existing format and then I also added like an FAQ um page so I'm hoping that people will just come away from it having learned something new or um recognizing the importance of the work that these animals do um because it's really really valuable and they help people like myself every day in all of these different ways so yeah as someone who doesn't have a service animal um, I had not really considered the role of or the impact of service animals during a disaster did you do any, did you find that there was a need for any outreach to people who uh, don't have service animals to understand how to support people with disabilities who need service animals during a disaster? Um, that is a really good question. I don't think um, we didn't end up asking like specifically people who like didn't have service animals. Um, we did, you know, we had a meeting um, with you and a bunch of the other people who worked on the guide. Um, that would have been an interesting conversation definitely to have. So I um, would be curious what the people's, um, disabled people's relationships to that is versus if they have a dog versus if they don't. Um, and whether they would think about it or not, um, or think about like getting one themselves. That's, that's a really good conversation to have. I would be curious to see what people would say. Um, and like, as for people who aren't disabled um, and know about service dogs, I think um, there's, a, there's a saying in like the service dog, or not a saying, but like a, phenomenon in the service dog community um, called service dog fraud where people will actually um, buy like service dog vests for their regular pets and like pass them off as like emotional service animals um, which obviously there are licensed and registered emotional service animals but a lot of people um, who don't actually have a need for them um, tend to take advantage of that. And so I think it really contributes to um, the like misinformation around service dogs. And um, there's been new policies for airlines. They have said like only dogs um, in the last couple of years or so um, because people have wanted all of their animals to be with them um, on a plane. And the airlines were like, okay, we're just gonna take dogs because this is kind of getting out of hand. Um, so that's a really, it's a really interesting um, thing that happens. And I think um, when you actually are a person with a service dog, it sort of undermines your ability to like walk into a certain business and have obviously the official vest and the paper somewhere, but like feel like you need to explain yourself. 
um, because there's so many existing cases of um, people who don't actually need them. Um, so it's it's a really interesting um, it's a really interesting thing to think about, and obviously like people obviously have emotional service dogs, but it's really interesting the fact that um, people will take advantage of that. I'd like to ask the, the flip side of the question that I just asked, which is Hannah, while you were doing research into service animals and disaster preparedness, did you do a lot of outreach to other people who are involved in the service dog or service animal community. Is this something that, that you are seeing a lot of input on from other people with disabilities? Um, so I didn't actually, we had thought about, um, we had thought about um, reaching out to different um, organizations, um, who provide service dogs. Um, but then we were talking about it and we're like, they probably wouldn't um, give away like their client information or whatever, because we were trying to find people who have service dogs in Vermont for a little bit. Um, it would have been interesting, I think, like if I ever do something like this again, like it would have been interesting to like loop in my service dog um, organization, they're called Needs, um, and they are in Massachusetts. Um, and I'm sure they would have a really valuable perspective on this sort of work, but I didn't actually end up getting to talk with um, some organizations, which would have been really valuable. I guess. Well, I, I mean, I felt this way, maybe Hannah felt this way also, but um, I struggled with the concept of, you know, having, feeling like you have to make the case, right? Like there are so many of this type of disabled person and like, that's why you need to pay attention. Um, but we know in reality, it's like, well, we all have rights. Like, even if there's one person who needs, you know, to bring their service animal with them to a shelter, like this is worth it for them. So, right, like Hannah said, we didn't, we didn't go down, down the route of like pursuing those numbers. I do think that would be interesting to have, you know, those data sets in the future, getting a sense for how big that population is. Uh, you know, and, there, and it wouldn't be perfect because people are, you know, permitted by law to train your own service animals. It's not like you're necessarily connected to one, you know, trainer organization or another. And so I guess that's my little, call for folks that do, you know, data collection and um, I guess statistics. <laughs> uh, it would be nice to have that. And I guess I'll plug like some grassroots advocacy being done by um, DISDATA, D-I-S-D-A-T-A, -D um, who are trying to, you know, highlight the gaps in disability related data collection and how can we advocate for better, better information. That's funny because that that actually ties into the, the next question that I had for the two of you, which is, um, Hannah, you specifically mentioned, you know, if, if you do this again, are you planning on continuing this type of research into service animal acceptance and, and service animal accommodation? Um, I kind of have a layered answer um, on this. So I don't know if I would ever like do this specific like research and work again, um, like around like emergencies specifically, but I do know like when I do get my service dog, um, I'm gonna do research and I'm gonna like, I want to encourage other um, disabled people and my service dog organization actually just, they sent out like this monthly newsletter and they just announced that they got um, Walmart to stop selling um, service dog vests in their stores, um, which is a really big deal because a lot of um, companies like that, like Amazon, like sell them commercially 
um, and you can just, you know, buy one. Um, and so I definitely think like I'll continue like service dog advocacy work in some sense because I will have one at some point. Um, but yeah, I don't really know. It might, it might really be something I'm passionate about again. And um, if I do, I will have a lot of interesting information to find out and contact people with. And there's always more to find out, you know? So um, if I did do it again, I think it'd be really interesting. I'll just mention another, um on the point of like information and data is that it wasn't immediately, it was actually, I don't think I found, we found any sources that kind of got at the numbers of people that have been evacuated in Vermont over time. Like that wasn't easily, I'm, I'm sure it's out there, but it was not easily accessible. And so we don't know how many people ended up in shelter for any reason, um, but, we do know. So I guess thinking about continuing the work in the future, uh, you know, Hannah is a very engaged, uh, multi-talented, um, active person who does so many things and you've got like so many goals and other things to do. Um, so I guess in your very busy schedule, um, you know, maybe there's room to do some outreach on getting more people to fill out the a workbook and just taking that step and that's becoming even more important with the way that like weather is happening today <laughs> you know like what is what is going to drive me out of my house it's it's going to be different like later um than what it is you know like i'm in new york we had this like big tornado warning recently which was totally weird and it's like what is happening and uh you know people need to think about that you know like okay, maybe I wasn't thinking about going, you know, that I might end up in a shelter <laughs> before, but now maybe, maybe probably. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be done. Absolutely agree with the, the wackiness around extreme weather and how much it continues to appear, how much it's how many more episodes of extreme weather impact uh, all of us? I think this is an evergreen topic that really needs more data, like you said, and uh, more exhaustive guides for how people can deal with the eventuality when it happens rather than, than if. Katie, I wanted to ask you um, uh, for a second about just turning a little bit to, can you talk about your experiences uh, as a person with a disability uh, going into law? I'm, I've, I'm really curious about that. Sure, so um, I am legally blind and I'm happy to be called blind. Um, uh, blind or legally blind is fine with me. Um, since birth, I have albinism. And uh, then later in life, I realized that I, I live with anxiety and depression. So now I'm disabled, a disabled woman, <laughs> um, for sure. So um, I, well, let's see. Um, growing up with a disability, I was kind of like introduced to special education. Having an IEP, like supports that need to be in place in education. And so I noticed, like, I noticed differences in the way that, you know, I was treated compared to other people. Um, I got connected with the blindness community as a teenager. Uh, I'm really, I'm really so grateful for some of the, so there are some blindness advocacy organizations out there. Uh, one of them is the National Federation of the, of the Blind. They brought me in. I met other blind people, like, you know, which is really great. Um, and um, I learned about these, I, I guess one, one memory that really stands out for me is learning just how um, difficult it can be and how inaccessible voting um, was for people then, and I guess can still be today. Um, and that just 
you know, really stuck with me. Um, I, I thought to myself, you know, why, how could that be? <laughs> what, what, why is that happening? Um, so I was, I had this like, um, like, I guess, anger or indignation that I carried with me. And I was really interested in learning how different systems, um, how disabled people um, are affected by all the systems. And I ultimately decided to go to law school. I had a mentor, also a woman with a disability, uh, who used her law degree to advise nonprofit organizations in other countries on disability inclusion. I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. I want to do that. And I ended up going to law school and, uh, you know, did the bar exam and all those things, um, which is, and going through that process is like fraught with barriers for disabled people still. Um, it's, it's been a little while since I graduated, but um, I know that barriers still exist. And it's been, I've used, I started off in international uh, human rights, did some national level advocacy and advising organizations, uh, moved into the Independent Living Network in New York, now I'm in aging. And it's been it's been a pleasure to be able to see how the law has impacted people, where it falls short, what we can change. And uh, especially now working in at the intersection of aging and disability, it's great to think about how we can support people who are both aging with a disability, but also aging into disability and acquiring uh, disability, disability later in life. And a big part of that is, um, getting people to feel comfortable identifying as a disabled person and, you know, maybe not feeling pride today in that fact, but, you know, you know, adopting that identity for themselves. So I think I answered your question. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned is that you had a mentor um, when you were younger. Is that some, is, was that through this same, this same disability empowerment network? Actually, no, that was just one of those things that happens. Um, I attended a conference because I was interested in the law. Actually, <clears throat> I believe it was the Tenbrook Disability Law Symposium that takes place in Baltimore. And uh, I wasn't, I was um, completing my undergraduate degree, went, met a um, disabled woman lawyer who said, hey, come, come intern or work for me. And I was like, yes please. <laughs> uh, and that, um, well, uh, maybe I'll email her after this and just say thank you again. But um, having that was incredibly important for my growth. Now, one of the things that folks who are just listening to this episode might not realize is that, at least to me, the two of you seem to be very different in ages. Um, I think, Katie, you're a little bit older than, than Hannah is. So, um, Hannah, you, you are you're in your early 20s, maybe? I'm really bad at, at guessing. I am, I'm about to turn 17 in September, actually. So close. Okay. So knowing, <laughs> knowing that, um, has your, your mentor, has your mentorship relationship with Katie changed how you approach thinking about your future? Yeah, I, um, it's interesting that you say that because like for a lot of my life, um, we talk in the disability community, we talk about independence, independence, independence. And in Empower Camp, we also talk about a lot about that. And while it's really great to have the sense that I can do a ton of things on my own and that I am capable, it's also like this mentorship has made me like value, really value um, like getting support from people um and how it can be really beneficial to you um I know that when I'm older I'm gonna you know go to college and have to 
have help there. And then when I graduate and live somewhere, I'm going to have to hire PCAs. And that's just like a reality that I'm going to have. Um, and I think this has really um, helped me understand the balance, at least for me, of like being independent, but also recognizing that there's a lot of awesome people out there who can help you and guide you um, like Katie has done for me. So um, yeah, I really appreciate the question because it was something I was thinking about. And I, <laughs> I mean, I, I strive to be as, you know, outwardly as comfortable in my skin as Hannah is. And um, I appreciate seeing that. And that's why I said, I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm being mentored. Like I feel like I'm growing just by seeing how Hannah interacts with the world and how you, um, you know, you carry yourself differently. You know, I guess we all, we all come to terms with like disability in our own ways. And, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with like internalized ableism and, you know, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have not changed. And um, so I guess I can say the same for me, like my, I forget the wording of the question, but I feel like, um, yeah, like my, 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 my future is also shaped by um, working with Hannah. I appreciate that. It's been it's been really nice to uh, have a friendship and a partnership, and like someone who has helped me with this awesome project, but also like someone to be like, "Hey, I'm freaking out. Like, do you, do you relate?" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's been really awesome. For sure. And uh, you asked about age. I was born two years before the ADA was signed. So um, I guess we're both technically in the ADA generation. Um, it's a little weird to me to think that I existed before <laughs> the law was in place. Um, but, you know, so I guess things were being figured out then. And um, I will say, I guess, part of Hannah, your, um, like your outward, um, your persona, you, you also, um, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I want to mention that, you, you know, you're very involved in theater and you love theater and you love performance. And um, I'm sure that's, that's a big part of why I get so much out of my relationship with you. Yeah, I, I, am, a, I am a performer at heart 24 um, seven. And I actually um, would really love to do in my future like advocacy work surrounding um, theater and people with disabilities because um, the film and media industry is getting there with the disability representation, but the theater industry, like especially like Broadway, needs a little bit more of a nudge. So um, I would really, that's my dream is to um, help other people with disabilities realize that they can and deserve to be on big um, stages and tell authentic stories. Um, and stuff like that. So I would really love to do that. I would love to follow up on uh, with a question about uh, your experiences with uh, the theater and disability, Hannah. Where are you seeing that things need to change in, in theater productions and the theater community? Like what, where, where are some places that, that really need a push in terms of disability advocacy in the theater? Yeah, um, I think uh, this is really broad, but I'll get, I'll get more there, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, just people's mindset in general, I think. Um, for Broadway is, Broadway is big. Like Broadway is all about like super big numbers and really emotional songs that like made you cry. Uh, I've been to I've lucky I've been lucky enough to go to Broadway shows and I always like walk out of the theater being like whoa. Um, 
and I can't stop talking about it for like two days after because it's such an emotional and raw and beautiful experience. Um, and but a lot of the things about the shows are big, and um, they choreography. Um, in general, like a lot of the choreography um, is not like super adaptive and inclusive. Um, and so I would love to like talk to people who work in that space and be like, hey, um, here's how you can make your dances adaptive for everybody. And everybody can be doing the same thing because, um, because if one person just does it, like it's not gonna, like it's not gonna make a difference. But if people see everybody doing the same dance moves um, and everybody participating in the fullest extent of who, what they're doing like that, that'll make a really big impact. Um, I also think um, like casting, um, there's a show called Wicked. Um, it's basically the prequel to Wizard of Oz. So it's about the friendship between the Good Witch and the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, and uh, the Wicked Witch, her name is Alphaba. Her sister, Nessa Rose, um, is in a wheelchair in the show. Um, and she's never been played by an actress or actor with a disability. Um, which, you know, makes for an inauthentic experience. And I have a very real love-hate relationship with that show because the music is so good and the story is really good, but that's the only part that I have a problem with. Um, so just encouraging people that disabled people are out there and we want to be hired and there are performers and um, like also just casting people with disabilities in disabled roles, but also just in roles in general, um, because we wanna be there. And also like making your stories more inclusive. Like people, people wanna be able to tell a story that feels true to them and not have it be like, oh my gosh, this character has a disability and that's their whole entire character arc and that's what they'll sing about for like 90 minutes while they're on stage. Um, but like rather has just them as a human being um, going through the world as we all, as we all do. Um, and yeah, I think there's some like, I don't know if you know, um, Ali Stroker, she's a woman with um, a disability and she's actually the first person in a wheelchair to win a Tony Award, um, which is one of the really big awards in theater. And that was a huge deal for me. Like when I saw that YouTube video, I was like, oh my gosh, like if she did it, then so many other people can do it. Um, and she won that award for playing um, a character in Oklahoma who um, isn't disabled in the in the show so um the fact that she won and um won for playing a character who's like their who their character like it's not about them being disabled and she was just the perfect one for the role and like that's why she won like that was such a huge turning point for me um and I hope to inspire like the next generation of people in theater to just think a little more inclusively. Um, and there's so many cool shows happening on Broadway right now. Um, and I think we just, we we can get there. So yeah, I, I'm really excited to do that work someday. So returning one last time to this, uh, this idea of the, the, the mentorship experience. Um, can I ask, what's been the most surprising thing that the two of you have learned from uh, being in the mentorship relationship? Do you wanna start, Katie? Maybe it's not surprising to me, but it might be surprising to other people, is that um, when we talk about the camp experience. I'm sure there are people out there that might assume that people working at camp are non-disabled folks. 
but that is not the case. <laughs> Our mentors, the people that go to camp, um, we're women and girls and non-binary people with disabilities. And we are in, we're in these mentor-mentee relationships. We provide support and uh, attendant services um, to each other. And, you know, maybe people don't realize that that happens a lot more than they might guess. And it's a lovely thing. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it's really nice to like have people help with your attendance stuff and your personal care needs and stuff because sometimes it can be awkward like when you as a disabled person are asking for help and you know, I have a lot of um, great able-bodied friends who are so cool about it and um, I'm very lucky but it's it was nice to be in a space where like people could relate um, to that and we were able to provide those for each other and so it like the, the sort of natural awkwardness you sometimes feel is kind of not there which was really nice. Um, I think I don't know, surprising. Um, I was just really like surprised that I um, like accomplished what I did in a year because when you're starting a thing and they're like, oh, you're doing this for a year, your first instinct is like, oh my gosh, that's such a long amount of time. I'll be like, I'm great. And then it's like May and you're like, what? Um, but I feel like with, cause like the scope of the like base for the product is so large. And I feel like um, at first I was really, really intimidated by like trying to find something that I really cared about and narrowing it down enough so that I could actually make change. And um, I feel like I really did that. And um, it's, it's a small part of change, but I hope that people will you know, open up the guide and find those pages and be like, hey, I didn't see this in there before. That's really cool that this level of representation is in there now. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to let people know that it like is gonna exist now and you can find a morsel of information um, about that within the internet abyss. Um, and yeah, I was, I was just really surprised that, like, I guess it's just hitting me, like, it's not a small thing what I accomplished, like, I worked really hard on um, this, this particular thing, and I couldn't have done it without the support of Katie and all the other people who have helped, but um, I am really proud of the fact that I, like, actually made change because I'm um, an activist in, in all the senses of, of just not not just with people not just for people with disabilities but like every other minority group and I'm a firm believer that you actually go out and do something if you can um, so I'm really proud that I actually got to make this concrete change that will now be like out in the world for people to see. Thank you for that. I'm, I have just one final question for the two of you. You are both uh, disability advocates. You, you create change in the world. Hannah, you mentioned you know, you're an activist. What's, what's the most important thing that you each have learned through your advocacy with and for the disability community? Um, I'll start if that's okay. Um, I think just like realizing that there's not like, it's very easy to feel like there's not space for you. Um, and it's very easy to feel like alone and that you're, that you're the only one living your experience or an experience like it. Um, but like the fact that 
it's hard, but like you have to make space for yourself. And that can be really hard because you have to stand up to people and be like, hey, this is an issue I really care about. And like, did you know this? Um, and I think making space for yourself in a world where there's like 7 billion people is <laughs> kind of intimidating because you're like, you're like, why? Like, I deserve this space, but also, like, there's, again, 7 billion other people who also deserve space. Um, but especially for me, like, I realize that, like, if people see me making space for myself, like, they'll realize that they can do it, too. And, like, it's so important for everybody to make space for themselves. And I think that's one of the things that I first learned and that sometimes you have to do it on your own and you'll start and then other people will follow you um, or people will pave the way for you um, to make space and it can be scary but once you make space for yourself and like let it be known that you're you're here like it's it's a very empowering feeling so that is probably one of the biggest things that I've I've learned and tried to put into practice um, during this work. And I'll just add for me, so there, there, I mean, there are so many things that I could answer with, but one that's on my mind lately is just uh, the importance of hearing and seeing, seeing each other and, and hearing each other's stories and like how we got to where we are and what your experience has been. Um, and through through that, you know, coming to a point where we can work together, um, you know, when you're part of a campaign or you're just trying to, you know, change a system, change a law, change a policy, you know, affect the right person, um, we we might end up spending less time hearing from other individuals or. Um, base building, you know, reaching out to other people that haven't had the opportunity to, to share, to, you know, advocate or anything like that. So I think that's been on my mind. And I, I think I have a question to add for Hannah. Um, so I don't want to forget that, you know, a big part of this is like about your transition to independence and adulthood. Um, so I guess I would like to hear from you, like, what would your message be to parents of future Empower Camp attendees? So like class of 2023, what, like, what do you want other parents to know who are thinking about, you know, their, their kid, their child, well, and, and guardians as well, parents and guardians, I should say, um, you know, who are, you know, probably at different points in how they support their their disabled kid? Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting because for me with my parents, um, they raised me from the beginning um, and they, they always said to me, I remember them always saying, like, never think that you can't do something. Like you can try something and it might not, work out for you or you might not love it or and you might not do it the same way as other people but there's other ways that you can do it and will like help you do that so I grew up very much with the mindset of like I'm things are open to me like even if I don't think that they're possible for myself um and I'm so grateful to my parents for that um because I think not all people with disabilities have that or grew up having that. Um, I think, um, I just remember really clearly my first um, day at this camp I do called Zeno Mountain Farm um, there in Lincoln, Vermont. And I am actually going there this summer for two weeks and I've been going since I was about seven years old. Um, and it's a community of people with and without disabilities. Um, and we are all 
on an equal playing field and we all just hang out and be in that space with each other and it's like honestly a really magical space to be in um but I just remember very clearly my parents like dropping me off and because I was so young I only stayed for the day like I live like I'm very lucky to live like 15 minutes away so I would only I would stay for the day when I first started and now um I stay over in the cabins um but I remember my parents like giving the people all this stuff and being like okay like don't forget like this is how you put on her orthotics and like she needs to be helped with this and then this and this and the people at Zeno were like okay she's gonna be fine like we're, we've got her and so my parents left and I imagine they were a little bit like um okay like we're leaving Hannah with these like older strangers essentially and like how is she gonna fare and is she gonna be okay and, um but I feel like at least for me like seeing them sort of I don't know if this is a corny word, but, like, seeing them sort of evolve um, made me a lot more comfortable being, like, after that, being, like, them, they noticed that I was able to, I was fine, like, I had so much fun, and they sort of realized that I would be okay, um, and, like, even now, I'll still be, like, I'll still stress about things, I'll still be, like, oh, like, I want to talk to this person about what support I'm going to have and that sort of thing. But I think for my parents, like, it's made me a lot more confident, like, telling them, like, hey, I can actually do this on my own, like, and I'll ask you if I need help when I really appreciate it. But I can also, but I'm also going to try to do this on my own. Um, and I think that's kind of hard when you're a kid and especially if your parents, like, you're a child of like parents who are able-bodied and just like want the best for you and when you were young like they heard that you had a disability and they you know you never want to see your child struggle and I think it's hard for them at first to like know that I would move around the world differently and it wouldn't always be easy but um I think me being able to get to a place where I could tell them like hey I know this is scary for me and it's probably scary for you but like I can do it like and if I'm not fine like I'll call you like like I recently went to a leadership conference and I was really nervous about it because I was the only person there with a disability and I was like oh my gosh like who's gonna help me like is this gonna be okay and we were on a college campus and that was really wild and it's really cool and I ended up having such a good time and my parents were like I know you'll be great and if you're not like call us and I texted my mom every day and I was like I'm doing great I'm having a great time so anyway really long-winded answer but I would just say like it's really hard to give your kid like independence um and it's really hard to like imagine them away from you and like are they gonna be okay but I think it's so empowering for like your kid to know that their parents support them or their guardians support them um in what they do and they they understand that you're gonna be a independent human one day and they're helping you along on that journey and they trust you to be okay with other people and um like letting them know that you think that they're capable is such a big thing um so yeah I would just say like trust that you know what's best for each other um and trust that like people are gonna do what they want to do and they wouldn't do it if they felt like they were going to be like unsafe or anything um but like empowering your kid especially a kid with a disability is so important so you inspired me to modify my answer to the last question um hearing you talk about seeing your your parents change and you change and um things like that and on 
So being an advocate or an advocate, uh, activist or really any, you know, anything, whatever you're doing, it's important to have goals. And that's something that I've learned uh, in advocacy is having really clear goals and then an assessment process to see where you are in reaching those goals. Um, Hannah, it, well, actually both of us, we had to do assessments before and after camp. We've had to, you know, justify like <laughs> the process you know, where, where, like, how far we've come and why and what are the challenges. And it's important to do that in, like, in all areas of life. Um, and it's okay if we end up not liking something or it doesn't work out, but at least you can see, you know, that you tried something, you know, why it happened the way that it happened. And uh, so that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I would also, if it's okay, I'm going to, like, add something to that. Um, like, and if, like if you have a goal and you're like working toward it but you're realizing like you're not you're like you gave yourself a specific amount of time and you're like at that amount of time and you realize you haven't completed it all the way or whatever like that's okay because you were working toward it and like you can just you can modify it you can do something else entirely like life isn't supposed to be all figured out all the time so like it's good to have of course it's good to have clear goals and like I've had a really specific dream of like what I want to do for a while now but like I don't know like who knows like I don't know where I'll be for college like I don't know where I'll be in the world in like four years like I don't know so it's you also don't have to have all your stuff together all the time. You don't have to have all your stuff together all the time is a fabulous motto to live by and something I'm definitely going to take away from this conversation, which I have enjoyed so very much. Katie Carroll and Hannah Gallivan, thank you so much for coming on our podcast and talking about so many different topics and experiences. This has been phenomenal. And I wish you both the best of luck with your upcoming endeavors. Thank you for having thank you. me. The University of Vermont Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. We support, we teach, we study, we share, we connect. Find out more at go.uvm.edu slash cdci.